Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ARC 402D, uh, Architectural Design Graduation Project at uh, Ozegin University. Today, we are going to host um, Luca Orlandi, who is going to talk about Galata and Pera in Ottoman time. This topic is very much related with the uh, graduation project assignment, which is designing the Museum of Galata on the Oglu's waterfront. Uh, thanks for being here, um, Ozgil Guvanci, who is um, a research assistant and PhD candidate at the Faculty of Architecture and Design of Ozgil University, is going to introduce our guest, Luca Orlandi. Uh, Luca Orlandi is an architect and an architectural historian. He graduated in history of architecture from the Faculty of Architecture at University of Genoa in Italy. He obtained a PhD in 2005 from the Polytechnic of Turin within the program History and Critics of uh, the Architectural and Environmental Heritage, discussing a thesis on architect Sinan and the transformation of the territories in Thrace during the apogee of the Ottoman Empire. He lives in Istanbul and works as assistant professor doctor in the Faculty of Architecture and Design at Özdeğin University. He teaches courses such as History of Architecture, Contemporary Architecture and Architectural Design Studio. He often participates in lectures, seminars and workshops in other Turkish universities and abroad, in, mainly in Italy. He is active member of ECOMS Italy and his fields of interest cover several topics like Ottoman architecture and Master Sinan, contemporary Turkish architecture, as well as Genoese heritage in the Orient and Travelage and narratives about the Levant. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Özge, for the presentation. And thank you, Alessandro, for the invitation. Of course, thank you to the participant today in a virtual class and the ones who are uh, physically in class today. I don't know many. Anyway, I'm uh, going to share my uh, presentation. I go full screen. Is it okay for everyone? Yes, it is okay now. Okay. So uh, what I will talk about uh, today, of course, uh, is a kind of synthesis since the time that we, we have. I will try to focus on mostly of sort of chronologically, chronological history of uh, Galata and Pera in Ottoman times and see the main important uh, architectural transformation uh, as a consequence also of the uh, uh, Con conquest of the city made by the Ottoman Turks. Uh, briefly, just the first slides. Uh, in the first slides, I'm just <clears throat> overlapping uh, what uh, Serjan Salam uh, told you last time about the history of the Genoese colony. But just to give uh, orientation, I mean, here is the location of Galata within uh, the city of Istanbul, and you can see this whole map clearly, of course, the relations also uh, and the strategic position of Galata, you see between the Marmara Sea, Propontide, the Black Sea, uh, the Bosphorus uh, Straits, and the small uh, branch of sea uh, indicated as Golden Horn. So you can see the really strategic and important position played by Galata in this uh, geography. And we are on the European side of the city of Istanbul, facing the other continents. And uh, so it's obvious that it was an interest through the centuries to keep this part of the city for strategic purposes and also for commercial use. Uh, here, just uh, to summarize, you can have a relations between the, the the beginning of the settlement of uh, Sikai, Pera, and uh, Galata, and the relations between uh, in Byzantine time between these uh, uh, areas and the rest of, of the city. But I'm skipping this because it's not the main focus of our presentation. Uh, but for instance, one event that uh, was very important was the so-called Fourth Crusade, which actually allowed more and more uh, Western uh, 
people to move actually within the walls of Galata and de facto Galata as a Genoese colonies at the end of the Latin occupation after 1261, 1267, de facto became a city within a city mostly populate, populated by uh, foreigners or by uh, specifically by Franks, people coming from Latin uh, countries. I'd like to point out through these uh, maps uh, just something about the relation first between uh, Istanbul, I mean Constantinople and uh, Galatapera. Uh, that were largely described, of course, uh, by uh, Serjan Salam last week. But I want to point out something, how uh, when we look at Bondelmonti and the further representation uh, based on Bondelmonti maps, here is before the conquest, uh, what we can see that mostly of the cartographer or mostly of the uh, ones who represent the city, try always to give this image of Galata as a Western city. If it was justified in the Bondel Monti, because we are before the conquest, but when we look, for instance, the uh, Hartmann Schneidel from the Chronic, Chronics of Nuremberg uh, book, uh, published in 1493, it means almost 40 years after the conquest, we can see that still what they want to represent of the city is still the Latin city, still the Middle Age European uh, light town. Even though both uh, uh, both the sides of the, I mean, both I mean, Constantinople and Galata were occupied now by the uh, by the Ottoman Muslim rulers. And even more striking, this is just a detail from uh, uh, Sebastian Munster, and we are almost 100 years and even more after Bondelmonti maps, 120, uh, 30 years after Bondelmonti's map, we can see that still the town of Pera uh, is basically represented as the 45 Genoese town. And that is quite striking because it gives um, like the idea that in the Western countries, uh, it was like if they couldn't accept that in uh, Constantinople and then Galata were instead Ottomanized. Uh, what is interesting here, because I will show you later, what is called Pera is indicated the, um, we, we used to call it uh, Galata, but let's say the Genoese called the in walled city Pera, and what it was outside that you can see here clearly represent by all these um, orchards and uh, uh, suburbans and countryside like environment were called the uh, Vigne di Pera. So the orchards or uh, graveyards of uh, Pera. And this is interesting because later on, after the Ottoman uh, occupation of these areas, Pera was renamed Galata by the Ottomans, but the parts outside the walls, as the Vigne di Pera, uh, continue to be used uh, to be called as uh, Pera. So uh, while before, uh, during the Latin occupation and during the Ottoman uh, sorry, the Genoese uh, domination of the areas. Uh, Pera was just the in-wall city. In Ottoman times, this part of the city started to be named as uh, Galata, and the rest outside the walls towards the hills and the heights of uh, uh, on the back of the fortified city was called Pera. And still, till the beginning of the 20th century, all this area is known as a Pera. So, Galata is the, now the part in the Ottoman time inside the inwalled city. What is outside is a pair. Uh, here, just briefly uh, to mention what uh, presents very clearly last time, uh, Serjan uh, Salam, just to show you uh, based on the map on uh, uh, Schneider Nomadis, we can see the uh, main remains of the. Uh, what we can heritage of uh, Galata. Uh, of course, I will not talk uh, about this, but just to give you an idea of how 
strong is still the presence, the physical presence, material presence through many, many buildings, walls, and so on. And uh, just as one of the most, uh, let's say, important landmark of the area, in these uh, images, I want just to show you all representation of the Galata Tower through the centuries. Of course, we don't have representation at this level after, uh, before the conquest, so the Genoese period, unless for the Bonden Monti map. But here you can see also the evolution and the changes of the tower uh, through the centuries and the changes also of the surrounding environment, which became, became more and more Ottomanized, as you can see. But we will see better in some other picture. But when, when you look, for instance, uh, these central images here, no, uh, you see so the tower surrounded by some kind of uh, vernacular, traditional vernacular, wooden architecture, trees, graveyards, also here very clear fountains, cemeteries, and whatever. So this is a completely a different image of Galata compared to the ones represented here. Think about here we are in 5050, 100 years after the conquest, the city was the city of Galata, Pera, was completely Ottomanized. And um, those pictures and those engravings are showing very clearly how it was the status of art up to the late 19th century. Uh, of course, we know very well for the dramatic uh, facts of the last months, uh, earthquakes are a big problem in Turkey. So mostly of the transformation that happened also in Galata were uh, mostly due to uh, earthquakes and fires, big fires that periodically destroyed the city. And so the city was rebuilt and rebuilt uh, several times, still keeping somehow the traces, especially in terms of urban pattern of the uh, Genoese, uh, of the Genoese period. Um, Congress of Constantinople, of course, from the point of view of the conquerors I and mean, from the point of view of Ottomans was uh, the beginning of new era for the Ottoman Empire. And uh, while in the Western world was represented as the fall of Constantinople, so the last uh, uh, the last resistance, let's say, against the Muslims. But after that, we can see, and here the image that I show you at the beginning, a very different representations of the city. I want to uh, point out this map made by um, Matrakshi Masur, we are in the, as you can see, uh, in the 30s of the 16th century. And uh, what we start to see when we look in, uh, of course, the map uh, has both Istanbul, Constantinople, Istanbul, partially Üsküdar on the Asian side, and then the area of Galata, you can see. So I zoom in the area of Galata, and what is uh, now very much visible the coexistence of previous period architecture with completely new architecture. I can, I want to point out, for instance, like this mosque here that we will see uh, later, or this small mosque over there, or also other pavilions and other buildings, the uh, cannon factories over there and some other uh, buildings. Here, we will talk a little about this because this is in the center, it's the Arab Jami that was then converted, we will see. So, but what does it mean? It means that slowly the town of uh, Pera uh, became part, of course, of the core of the capital of the Ottoman Empire with no need anymore of using the defensive structures and instead, architecture and new uh, dwellings and also important uh, public buildings or with specific functions like gown foundry, mosque, mosques, or here, for instance, the uh, so-called banyo, I mean, the, the shipyard of the Ottoman uh, fleets, were built, you see, all around the walled city. And... Um, this is very uh, interesting uh, because it shows how the that defensive structures that belongs to the Middle Age period has no any more meaning to exist in the Ottoman time 
since the core of and the capital of the Ottoman Empire uh, basically was never sieged. So no need for fortified anyway uh, walls surrounding the city and the city could spread outside the walls easily, especially uh, along the shores of uh, Karakeri and Topane and, and all the uh, Golden Horn uh, Straits. And on the other side, along the shores of the uh, Halic, uh, Golden Horn, towards, you can see here, reaching Katane and Eyup on the other side. So um, it's very interesting how the city start to, um, let's say, pass the border of the former uh, Genoese colony and spread in the countryside around. So that's therefore it's so important for us also what Pera became later. Uh, of course, uh, in Ottoman time, and uh, here I want to point out exactly, here you can see better in details, how the urban environment, especially in the, between 17th and 19th century, changed radically. You can see typical uh, vernacular uh, wooden houses who are characteristic of the Ottoman period, uh, let's say Ottoman and Turkish uh, houses, but not only limited to Turkish, of course. You can see, as I point out before, uh, this kind of architecture, monuments, Look, even the clothes of the people. I mean, of course, this is very far from the image that, in a way, we are thinking about when we're thinking about, uh, we have in mind when we're thinking about the cosmopolitan Galata. We will see that actually that image will come back uh, after 1850s, after a uh, war in Crimea, uh, when actually more and more Western start to move again from Western country into uh, towards the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, towards Istanbul, and especially in Galata and Pera area. So that is a very important step, but we will see uh, slightly later. So from this space, you can see, I want to point out uh, how it changed really the uh, architectural and urban environment with all these um, new buildings and new sort of, uh, life look for instance this this is an image where you can see from the heights of uh, pera a building belongs to the armenians community and what you see here this is a uh, 19th century uh, early 19th century uh, late 18th and early 19th century representation you can see very clearly from the heights of uh, pera those terraces and uh, typical vernacular wooden houses environment with tiles roof. You can see here the Topane uh, gun foundry with other structure next, next by. Here the mosque that we will see more in details by uh, Finan uh, Kilic uh, Ali Pasha Mosque and all the harbor also area next to Topane. But very interesting talking about the minorities because actually, uh, with the presence of the Genoese merchants, of course, more and more Westerns start to move uh, there already during the late Middle Age. And also many minorities somehow uh, coexist and cohabit together with the Genoese and with the, let's say, in general Italians. I mean, they were among uh, them, they were, uh, of course, um, uh, religious orders, friars, monks, priests, and many, many churches. There were also minorities like already some uh, Jewish, and we will see how the Ottomans, they implement the arrival of Jewish, especially from the Iberic Peninsula, from Spain, Portugal in particular, and um, also Armenian that were, of course, both Catholic and Orthodox Gregorians, or also other minorities, like, for instance, the so-called Rome Orthodox, I mean, what we used to call as the Greeks. And uh, just to mention these, um, I'd like uh, briefly to point out the uh, multicultural and multi-confessional aspects of Galata. Still today, look around, I just pick up, point out uh, some of the uh, most interesting religious building in the area. So you can see, for instance, a Russian Orthodox Church, 
and um, Gregorian Armenian church, uh, mosques, different. We will slightly see something, Berakhet Zadde, uh, Keman Kesh, Pasha, or uh, other kind of buildings like uh, Rum Orthodox, Greek Orthodox churches, Askenazi synagogue, eventually the Italian synagogue, uh, Armenian Catholic church, Crimean Anglican church, or the Catholic St. Pierre. Uh, church by the uh, Dominican friars. So this just to give an idea of the kaleidoscope and multi-cultural, uh, uh, even religious life of Galata through uh, the centuries. Galata now I'm talking about in an extended way, but all of these buildings are actually in Galata and just on the highest of the uh, Pera hills. And even uh, more, when we look at the Levantine, the so-called Levantine world in Galata, it's very interesting. I, I just selected some images where it's very difficult to identify who is who, no? I mean, you have very particular uh, dress and probably coats, but you can see the women. It's very difficult to, to say who was a Levantine, maybe Christian woman, who was the Muslim or the Jewish or the Armenian or the Arabs. And you can see very interesting also here, uh, kaleidoscopic, let's say, show off of costumes and uh, in a way to represent all the minorities coexisting in Galata for several years, several uh, centuries. Of course, not only in Galata, you can say all over the Ottoman Empire and specifically, of course, in the capital. But in Galata in particular, it was very strong the presence of the, all these uh, minorities. And also we uh, have to consider, for instance, that the population also changed a lot after the conquest. Uh, we talk about uh, some uh, thousands of inhabitants for uh, Galata uh, before the conquest. And just in the aftermath of the conquest, only, only 20 Turks as a resident within the uh, Galata walls within Pera, and also among them, some of them married with uh, Greek or Armenian women. That is quite interesting because they start right away to mix. And it's true also that many Genoese that were resident there uh, became Muslims for a simple reason. I mean, uh, not because of, let's say, spiritual conversion, but simply because many, uh, I mean, the minorities were subjected to uh, taxes, uh, high taxation from the Ottoman governor, from the, from the sultans. And uh, while the Muslims, they have, let's say, more, uh, better, they have better, better conditions. Therefore, many Genoese converted to Islam in that period to get benefits from uh, uh, from this uh, status uh, being as still i mean under the sultan but somehow i mean keeping more independently continue to keep in trades and uh, with especially with western countries and with genoa i want for instance to point out the case of iskander pasha who uh, whose land on the highest of galata was donated to the sultans for the uh, so famous uh, Mevlana Dervish Lodge. So uh, this is very still today is one of the most uh, important uh, place where you can attend uh, ceremonies of uh, Sufi, I mean, uh, spinning Dervish in Galata. Well, actually Iskander Pasha was a Muslim and he was the governor of Bosnia and in the Sanjak in Bosnia. But actually, he was a Genoese. So he converted and he gained, actually, was very successful as Ottoman governor in those areas. And his brother continued to work as a Genoese uh, merchant within Galata. And one land that belonged to them in the eyes of Galata was donated for the first uh, Meblana uh, Sufi lodge in uh, Istanbul. Just to tell you how complicated sometimes it is to uh, understand the uh, cosmopolitan and multicultural aspects of the city and of the Ottoman world in general. So here I would just to point out this colorful expression through the custom. 
Also, we don't have to forget that after the conquest, we are in a full Renaissance period. So many are the contacts, the encounters, cultural encounters between the Ottoman Empire and the Western world, especially with Italy. I mean, in the aftermath of the conquest, for instance, Mehmed II wanted Venetian painters uh, like Gentile Bellini uh, to portray him as a Western emperor. And this also to consolidate a sort of friendship or better trade friendship, let's say like this, between the Republic of Venice and the Ottoman Empire. Or even more striking, I want just to point, point here about these Mediterranean encounters, the so world famous Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, one of course of the fountainheads of the Italian Renaissance, that offers, he offered his services to the Sultan, Bayezid II, this, the son of Mehmet the Conqueror, uh, to design for the designing of a bridge in Galata, connecting exactly Galata with Istanbul, Constantinople. And uh, the story also behind this is quite interesting. You can see here in this uh, slide, uh, I want just to point out the sketch that Leonardo made about the, the bridge of Galata. And the letter, unfortunately, only the transliterated letter in Ottomans that Leonardo wrote to the Sultan Bayezid II and um, explaining the services that uh, if he was accepted to the court of the Sultans, what he could have uh, done as engineer. So it's very much important uh, also to acknowledge that there was an awareness in the Ottoman Empire of what was going on in Europe, and the Sultan himself invited um, Leonardo. And uh, after Leonardo, for some reasons, there were already uh, friars, Dominican friars, Franciscan friars in Galata, uh, that through uh, Florence were managing how it was possible for Leonardo to travel there and work there. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. And the Sultan Bayezid II invited eventually uh, Michelangelo to design the same bridge. Uh, and of course, Michelangelo, since he was working for the Pope back then, beginning of the 16th century in Rome, of course, uh, it was not possible for him to move from Rome to go and work for the, let's say, the Sultans of the infidels, of course. But this, uh, if you want later, I can tell you maybe more details uh, about this story about uh, behind Leonardo's invitation to the Ottoman Empire. And we don't have any clue that Leonardo uh, went here or Michelangelo later. Uh, there are just rumors, but nothing proves that actually uh, neither Leonardo nor uh, Michelangelo had the possibility to visit Istanbul. Anyway. Moving on, uh, I want to present this map of Galata that I think also uh, Sir Jans uh, uh, showed you last time from the detail from Dostoya map. But what is very interesting from uh, our point of view, I just focus you know, within the Galata walls, you can see very clearly, uh, but about the distribution of population, uh, what Dostoya did here was uh, clearly uh, representing through different colors and uh, the, um, also the uh, dwellings built in stone or mixed maybe stone and bricks and the dwellings uh, built completely in wood. And usually the dwellings built completely in wood were typical of the Ottoman, let's say Ottoman period vernacular uh, architecture. So here it's very clear that for instance, this area of Galata was mostly populated by Muslims, while all the areas here and here were populated by other minorities, like, of course, the Latins, Catholics, the Jewish, uh, without ghetto, they were quite uh, spread in Galata, not with the specific uh, areas reserved to them, the Armenians, both Catholics and uh, Gregorians or uh, Orthodox, and the uh, Orthodox. And here also you can see how the city spread outside the Galata wall with Muslims, mostly Muslim uh, settlements. 
what can be recognized very easily is the that in uh, within the wallet city you can see here the tower it's very clear all these green areas in which also uh, find place many um, not just orchards but also cemeteries were mostly built or let's say done in the in the um, parts where the Muslims were living and not in the other part of the city. And also very interesting, beside these parts of Galata, here there is the Arab Jami that play an important role for the Muslim community within Galata. You can see that the grids is still very much regular. We are talking about the area exactly of your project because it's based on the, on the first uh, settlements of Galata. So it's very rigid grid. But we see that slowly all those streets instead, they are scattering in a typical uh, Muslim way of build the city with a lot of um, roads that end in the so-called that ends or cul-de-sac and with the houses, cluster of houses around some specific point. So it's completely a different way of building the city that has nothing to do, look with the rigid grid that you can see here where the Latins or best the, the Franks and Levantines were living. So it's completely another way of in, uh, considering the settlements with a lot of cul-de-sac, houses around some courtyard and dead end street. So this is typical of the Ottoman uh, town formation. So this just to point out. And Dostoya, look, we are in 18, uh, 1850s, 1860 almost, uh, still the city was presenting this characteristic. It changed a lot when it became the modern, let's say, municipalities of uh, Bayolu after 1860s. It changed a lot all the, uh, let's say, urban layout of the city after those years and after also earthquakes and fires who repeatedly destroyed the, the city. And uh, well, when it comes to the, let's say, Ottoman, uh, heritage in terms of architecture, I point out exactly as I did for the using the same map of Nomadis uh, Schneider, point out the Ottoman uh, buildings here. So we will see more in details some of them. I mean, let's say the landmarks of the Ottoman period, classical, I mean, 15th, 18th century, let's say. So we can start from the Berakhet Zade Ali Effendi Mosque, that was actually the first mosque built in uh, Galata after the, the conquest. Uh, Galata, uh, let's say, spontaneously surrendered to the Ottomans and a few days after the conquest on the 2nd of June, 1453, they were signed already agreements between the Sultans and the Magnifica Comunità di Pera, so the Genoese community of Pera, agreement in which the Genoese could benefit of trade, could benefit of many things, but of course, they lost their independence. Okay, therefore, uh, we start to see some mosques built in the core of Galata. In this case, Berakhet Zade is very near. Is here. You see, is this one very near the tower? So, in a very central area, exactly to, in a way, confirm the new uh, the power of the new rulers. Uh, by the way, this mosque. Be careful because it looks like an old Ottoman mosque. Uh, actually, it's a fake uh, building. Uh, I lived there, by the way, I was living here uh, when first came to Istanbul, and here there was an auto park, okay? There was a parking area. Also, this to explain something about how it works also, in a way, the idea to revitalize the Ottoman past, the Ottoman heritage. It looks like an old mosque, but believe me, nothing left of the building that was destroyed by an earthquake. And then after 1920s, start to be dismissed as a mosque and then was completely uh, canceled and didn't exist anymore. And only in 2007, in a way of revitalizing the Ottoman and Muslim worlds, they rebuilt from scratch and faking like an historical building. So this is a case of a fake historic building within the uh, context because nothing was there. I mean, there was a park, car, auto park. There was not even any traces of the basement of the building, zero, almost zero. Anyway, but nevertheless, they rebuilt also to confirm the importance of Islam in, uh, in the country, of course. 
Uh, here we can see instead another important buildings that that belongs directly to uh, Mehmed the Conqueror, who wanted the new market area within the Galata walls and close to the seaside. It's very close to our area, the Fatih Bedesten. And unfortunately, it's in very bad condition, even from outside and from inside. You see, of course, it's used as uh, for uh, as retails from machinery and whatever. But uh, it's very hard to read from inside the structure, even though it's a beautiful architecture based on uh, nine domes uh, structures and with massive walls, stone and bricks masonry. Uh, with the monumental entrance, but kept in very, very shabby and poor condition, as you can see here. Then I want to po point out the uh, Arab mosque that was the former church of San Domenico and Paulus, very well presented by uh, Serjan in the last lecture. And today, what we can see that mostly of the uh, external walls, even though they present some spolia, from the previous Genoese uh, building, it's basically rearranged completely, um, but insisting on the same perimetrical area of the former Genoese uh, period church. And even the bell fry, you see, was transformed into a minaret for, for the, uh, the mosque. Here, when we look from inside or even the inner core, the courtyard, behind you can see Ottoman environment, with some uh, the courtyard with the tombs and with other uh, with the fountains in the middle for the for the ritual uh, for the ritual for the Muslims and even inside we can see a completely different environment. There are not anymore the main nave and the, the two aisles that characterize the um, the Genoese period church, but instead we have a huge prayer hall with an upper gallery, you can see here, completely done in wood. It's one beautiful example of wooden structure within this uh, gigantic and empty uh, hall. And uh, also we can see here the Rustem Pasha uh, inner, uh, inn or caravanserai uh, near, uh, again, near the shore, quite close to our area, uh, design area as well. In this case, uh, this building that was built by Rustem Pasha, the Grand Vizier of Sultan Suleiman after 1550s, replaced completely the uh, former cathedral of San Michele, uh, built by the Genoese. Uh, probably never uh, archaeological excavations were conducted in this area, but very probably the perimetral area is exactly the same area of the former Genoese church, but no evidence since uh, no archaeological campaign was ever done in this part of the city. Uh, what we can say for sure that around 1550s, we have uh, um, Petrus Gilius or Pet uh, Peter uh, Gilles, who was a traveler from uh, France, uh, and describe the antiquities of Constantinople towards the year 1550. And he described in this area exactly how the building was about to be demolished, to be transformed into a caravanserai uh, for the will of Rustem Pasha. And the architect of the building actually is a Sinan, the architect, one of the greatest uh, architects in Ottoman time. So we have actually written directly a witness of the transformation of the building and also change of destination of use, of course, from a church into a caravanserai. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that this uh, Arab mosque, it's so-called Arab mosque because after Isabella uh, from Castilla uh, kicked out from Spain all the uh, Jewish and Arabs from the uh, Iberic Peninsula, Many of them, both Jewish and Arab communities, moved and were invited to the sultans, Beazid II, to settle in Galata. Therefore, this church was donated uh, by the sultan to the Muslim community, to the Arab Muslim community. Therefore, their name, the name, the actual name, Arab Mosque. Don't trust what is written here when you read the something written uh, next to the door. Of the, of the building is written that this building belongs to the first siege of the city 
in 700 something uh, made by the Arabs. That's why it's originally Arabs and then later transformed into a church. This is completely a, a fake revisitation of history because it's not true and it's not proved by any uh, archaeological base. This was a Genoese church of the Genoese period, I mean, from the 12th, 13th century, and then transformed into a mosque only after the conquest of the city. Other buildings left by Sinan, since I mentioned Sinan, was one is the Sokolu Mehmet Pasha Mosque in Azabkate, very close to our area, outside the uh, city walls towards the sea. And I mentioned a little during the tour about this mosque that has the peculiarity of these minarets built detached from the building, as you can see here, due to the fact that the the land here is just a filled land above the water, so probably it was too heavy to be built in a correct position. Usually the minaret shouldn't be on this side from the back, but should stand instead on this side here. But probably since here it was exactly at the edge of the water, Sinan preferred, uh, after making some calculation, understood that it was better to push the minarets on the back, and you see it's even detached from the mosque and just as more bridge is connecting to the main building. And this on one side of Galata, outside the city wall, the general city walls towards the Golden Horn. And uh, this other building still by Sinan, on the other side, Topane, outside the city walls of the Genoese wall, towards instead the Bosphorus. And this also, you can see the years, 1580 is one of the masterpieces of Sinan. It's like reproduction in miniature, miniaturized size of Hagia Sophia actually. And uh, the canon uh, organ foundry in Topane, that was originally a building from the 16th century, but what we'll see today is the uh, transformation operated in the middle of the 17th century, so, uh, and the beginning of 18th century, eventually. So it was, uh, it is nowadays a monument, uh, belongs to Mimar Sinan University and used for exhibition space, Topane Yamire. But back then, it was one of the most uh, important uh, forgery for guns and cannons for the Ottoman fleet. And um, also another important building that I want to point out is the so-called underground mosque. And uh, Sir John presents very well as the Castello of Galata in the previous part. First, the Byzantine structure reused then by the Genoese and where the chain was kept that could close the golden horde in case of attacks from the enemies, and then transform, and the upper part of the castle completely lost, transform into in around 15, 1753, 1766, uh, 56, into a mosque, the so-called underground mosque. So today, if you go inside the mosque, what you see all these pillars, if you uh, take off all the uh, plaster, probably you will see the bulky stone masonry that were the base of the substructure of the castle of uh, Galata. And here, just I want to point out something because up to some years ago, this is a picture, look, that I took uh, several years ago. You can see almost 20 years ago, 2004, and a recent picture. We went there, you know, this is the gate of Harut. Uh, where there are still the Genoese uh, marble slab indicating the uh, Genoese family, I mean, the coats of arm of Genoese family of Doria and the Marude. But I want to point out that up to a few years ago, it was still readable, the Ottoman uh, vernacular environment. So look how pity, of course, it was very shabby, very in bad condition, but you can understand this house was leaning exactly where now there is this huge void next to the gate. You can see how close was this house to, and there were plenty of these houses. I remember when I visited this area, as I said, almost 20 years ago, before the construction of the bridge, uh, the Metro bridge, it was full of still these houses in ruins that were a memory of these wooden Ottoman uh, Galata houses, very well, present in Ottoman times. So it's really a pity that also this part of the city disappeared completely, I mean, canceled from memory. So just pictures can indicate that now they're presents. 
Then uh, I'm going to, towards the last part of the lecture, we see Galata and here we can see a cartography showed already by uh, Serjan showing how Pera develop outside the Pera vineyards and also Bayolu. Uh, while through the centuries, especially in 16th, 17th century, uh, the Genoese lost more and more the power, even the Magnifica Comunità of Pera uh, lost uh, basically completely the power. And other merchants, and among them the Venetians, start to rise again in the ranks and in the, let's say, in the close relation with the, with the Ottoman uh, sultans. So what happens that in Pera, may more and more uh, legations and embassy and uh, residences of ambassador and Western uh, power, let's say, representative were built. Uh, next to, of course, the Frank uh, town of Galata. And among them, in the 16th century, was very famous the uh, uh, residence of uh, Gritti, Alvise Gritti, who was the illegitimate son of the Balio uh, of Venice, so the ambassador of Venice, who later then was the Doge of Venice. And uh, uh, Gritti uh, became a Muslim and was one of the most uh, powerful men of all Pera uh, in the 16th century and was organizing huge parties, inviting all the Ottoman courts and he was very close uh, to the Ottoman. Of course, he was an Ottoman citizen in a way himself. And he was always uh, called as the son of the Lord, son of the Bey intending, of course, as the son of the uh, ambassador and then Doge of Venice, Gritti. And in Turkish, this word actually was Bey Olu, the son of the Bey, the son of the Signore, the son of the, of the Lord. And this name actually was the name then used after that to indicate both Pera and Galata till today. I mean, even today, the municipality is the municipality of Beyolu, thanks to this Venetian guy that in the 16th century became very popular. I, I want also to point out that, for instance, among all the residents, what is called today Palazzo Venezia, uh, not by chance, is the residence of the uh, Italian ambassador. And for a short time, it was the Italian embassy between World War I and the, um, before the, the ambassador moved to, to, uh, to Ankara. And so today is hosting the consulates, the, the Italian consulate. But the name of the building is Palazzo Venezia, just to confirm this tradition of the important role played by the Venetians in this area, uh, especially after 16th century. And, and when you look here, for instance, you can see that the Levantine Bayolu, Pera and Galata, it's something completely different. Now we are in the second half of the 19th century. We are in the period of the great reforms of the Ottoman Empire, the Tanzimat period. And you can see now a juxtaposition between the Ottoman town, I mean, the Ottoman city uh, of uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, and the heights of Pera. You can see completely two different approach, architectural approach. When you look at an image like this, it seems to be like in a Western uh, city rather than in the oriental. But when you look at the skyline of the um, uh, historical peninsula, you can see very clearly the strong and the power of the Ottoman Muslim rulers. In Galata, for instance, here we can point out uh, some buildings, the French embassy, the Italian embassy, and the Russian embassy. So you see monumental neoclassical-like palace that reflect very much the style that was, of course, uh, promoted in Europe, the new fashion uh, started after enlightenment in Europe and then became also the new architectural fashion in uh, Galat and Pera as well. And even when you look at the street, for instance, of the Grand Rue de Pera or staircases uh, leading, stairways leading to Galata Tower, you can see that the build environment is completely different and is a, like a mix of this cosmopolitan society now Look the picture, the postcard. If it weren't for the phases on the head of some of the 
people here or for the dogs, stray dogs on the street, you can think that you can be easily in Paris, in uh, London, or in Milan, or in any other European cities, even though if architecture presents some characteristic typical of the uh, Ottoman uh, architectural languages. Something presenting the modernity, here, for instance, in the Amici's book, uh, Constantinople, you can see exactly the show of, of modernity and the cosmopolitan aspect of the city towards the end of the century, the 19th century, as well as here, uh, Galata Bridge and Karakeri Harvard. And from architectural point of view, and I'm going to conclude, just a few examples here, how became actually as a urban structure the, in the late 19th century, all the Yolu and even extending to Taksim Square and all the surrounding. So you can see very much urbanized in a more Western way with the main avenue, which is Istiklal uh, Jadesi today, that was the Grand Rue de Tehran. And here's some aspect of the modernity, like for instance, the tunnel uh, funicular connecting the Karakoy directly with, the, with Istiklal, passing exactly under the, the Galata Tower, 500, uh, 500 meters tunnel, one of the first in Europe, after Paris, and here also some important buildings left by Arnubo style, which was the new fashion in Galata at the beginning of the 20th century, or even eclectic architecture, as you can see here, new Byzantine, Macintosh-like style, or this kind of Western-like hands or buildings in Galata between the, uh, the, century, the change of the century. And even the Wall Street of Galata, the street of the banks, where you can see very much monumental architecture uh, characterizing the new spirit of the city. We are about towards the end of the Ottoman Empire. All those banks were actually established by Western powers, of course, to give credits and somehow suck from the Ottomans what left of the empire that in few years in World War I will collapse completely. So uh, thank you. I think it's all for this presentation. And I'd like to have some discussion of something. If, it's, if you have thank questions. Thank you, please. Professor Orlandi, for your presentation about Galata in Ottoman times. Now, if you, anyone from the audience has, or from the classroom, does have any comment or question, you're welcome to raise your hand or turn on your microphone and your camera rather than the chat not many people in the room so i think we can handle that in a simple way thank you zainab so i got one question uh, so in the way you uh, outlined the Galata's profile, it, it, Galata is a Western, you know, part of, of Istanbul. And um, so basically, where is Ottoman Galata? Uh, given the character of Galata as a Western colony where the prevalent architecture is Western rather than uh, Anatolian or whatever, uh, how can we uh, really outline the Ottoman character of Galata? Well, to the example that I show you, I mean, you can clearly see there is a big distinction of Galata after the conquest up to the middle of 19th century, and then the last period of Galata and Pera after basically War of Crimea, because the War of Crimea brought more and more Western to move again in the Ottoman Empire, uh, this time as the ones, I mean, like sponsoring the Ottomans. And they were all there, English, French, Germans, Italians, now with their consolidated states, the popes, let's say, through the uh, Vatican, uh, as well as the Russians and many others. So uh, slowly the city transformed in the last part of the Ottoman, uh, last decades of the Ottoman Empire into a more Western-like, but at the same time still keeping some of the feature of the... Uh, Ottoman elements uh, within this new architecture. Uh, if I can, for instance, just uh, 
just to mention, uh, let me just show you these. Uh, the buildings, small fountain built by Ramondo da Ronco uh, in Galata, you can see here, the so-called Laleli fountains, whatever. It's a very small building, but it tells a lot about how all those architects, some of them were uh, local architects, Levantine by locals, others like da Ronco arrived in the Ottoman Empire, like in 1894. But look, this small monument, like a jewel, Daronko was influenced as an architect coming from northeast of Italy by the Austrian secession, was influenced by Otto Wagner. And it's clear, visible in this small building, the reference to the, uh, to the secession and to the Arnovo style. Actually, Daronko introduced Arnovo in the Ottoman Empire. But on the same way, the niche on uh, the fountain, it looks very much like the mihrab inside the mosque. So Daronko was combined elements from the architectural Western background, in this case, the Art Nouveau, mixing with local uh, Ottoman elements. And this is true for all the architecture of this time, where you can see elements that are always combining something from Western models and together with mixed with the local architecture. It's visible here, local, I mean, not necessarily um, Ottoman. In this case, for instance, Karakay Palace by Mongeri, there are references even to Byzantine architecture in the capitals on those uh, arches and uh, pilasters in the wall. So um, I have to say that it was very uh, interesting, this uh, continuous uh, mixing of elements from the traditions of Western world and uh, Turkish Ottoman, let's say, elements. But uh, Anatolian, I will not talk to Anatolian, it's something slightly different uh, because, I mean, even within the Ottoman architecture, there are many differentiations between Balkans and uh, somehow part of Anatolia and rest of Anatolian, Syria, and more, let's say, um, uh, Near East. Ottoman architecture. There are some, some differences. But in any way, it's very interesting to see how they overlap and how they mix together through the centuries. Thank you very much for the explanation. Actually, I have another question about that fountain. When we were working in this area with some of our students in the previous years, I was a bit interested. What was covering the outside of this fountain? And usually the photos that I could find about this area is showing the site as an empty area outside of the uh, Galata walls. Do you have any, let's say, information about how the urban tissue was around that fountain? Well, it was very much an Ottoman, a typical Ottoman environment, mostly inhabited by Muslims, that part. I'll show you in the Ostoya map. Actually, what the problem is that mostly disappeared because there were wooden houses and open fields, okay, and cultivated fields, mixed. So this part, uh, through the speculation, I mean, building speculation in the late 19th century was replaced by Han and by commercial buildings. But still, if you look in that area, there is a consistent uh, small mosque or masjid. You can still see a lot of them showing that that part of the Galata was much more, let's say, Muslim compared to the other parts towards the Karakoy or towards the Topane. So this is clearly uh, visible. Unfortunately, we lost completely all the urban uh, settlements. I mean, the Ottoman settlements, I mean, Ottoman period vernacular settlement. Okay, do we have any other questions? Uh, I have one, if it's possible, I can ask. Yeah. So I was wondering, so the Genoese walls, uh, the city walls were a main part uh, of the uh, the urban texture for a long time. So uh, was it possible uh, to preserve maybe some of these walls or uh, these towers they did they build uh, and preserve them to this day and live uh, within these walls? Or uh, was it better to just demolish them and uh, move on? 
Like look, the demolition happened quite recently, let's say, uh, after 1860s, uh, following the trend also in Europe to uh, get rid of all the city walls because they were obsolete and gain space to new uh, infrastructures like roads or new buildings. So uh, think up to 1850s, they were all preserved, all the city walls, and were demolished, uh, let's say, quite recently, most of them. And uh, But this was a trend very common. You, you can take example of similar, of the same period of the Paris, Osman plan in Paris after 1850s, or the Ring in Vienna, 1870s, or many other important cities in Europe. Uh, Milan, for instance, in Italy, happened exactly the same. Demolish, get rid of all these obsolete structures to build new infrastructures and uh, make the city more bre breathing also in a way through the use of boulevard, opening new avenues, and also, but also uh, new investments in terms of uh, buildings. And uh, well, we cannot do anything in, in that sense. At least what we should have an awareness to protect uh, today, 2020s, protect what is left. And what is left from each period, try to protect. I show you this beautiful example of a wooden house, Ottoman house, near to the uh, gates. We went there with the students when we had the visit, we went there and seeing that the area is completely devastated with the new bridge illegal auto park and nothing left of the uh, urban texture and uh, environment is really very really bad from my point of view. Uh, as architect, we should be aware to also restore, reintegrate, regenerate the area, but keeping in mind, I mean, that this one, the most important and historical areas of the city, where you should be able to read all the transformations through the centuries and not only focus like Disneyland, like the tower just as the only monuments. I mean, because this became a kind of Disneyland-like landmark uh, without anything I and mean, just entertainment, you know. So uh, we have to be very careful and as architects to design, always considering the overlays and the overlap, the layers, multi-layers and the overlap of historical phases. If you Google, I wrote a lot about this uh, topic about preservation of Galata. So please, you can find maybe some of my articles online. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add two more things to that question. The first one is that the culture of conservation is quite recent. So it first appears by the end of the 19th century, but then develops you know, in the 20th century. So in those times, they didn't want to preserve anything. It was not part of the dominant culture. Uh, the first thing. So, you know, the reason why they, they did demolish these walls, one of them is because they didn't care. The culture had not developed yet the notion of preservation, heritage, values, etc. But the other one, specifically for the walls, is that these city walls, the ones of Galata, but, you know, all the walls we, were built in a time where gunpowder was not in place. So the, the conformation of the structure was not uh, suitable for the protection, of, you know, for the new warfare, hence the introduction of gunpowder. So the substitution of those medieval walls with new, you know, uh, defensive infrastructure, infrastructures happened throughout the world starting from the 16th century, gunpowder. But, you know, if they had the old walls in the city, uh, you know, it was not a big issue. They, they, they were not needed for the fence, so they stayed there in many cases, even Rome, perhaps, or, or uh, you know, Verona, many other cities. But there's one moment when these walls are not welcome anymore, and that is, you know, you know uh, in the 19th century, we have these, you know, revolutionary events, like the French Revolution, La Commune de Paris, and the people they use these defensive structures as a, you know, as a put themselves inside and defend themselves from the the army that wants to, you know, the police. So the demolishment of walls and small alleys is key to the safety, security of the city against political turmoil. And uh, the Hausmann plan for Paris is a good example of that kind of idea. 
I'm not saying that they demolished the walls in Galata for this reason, but that was the trend. We don't need them. They are dangerous. We don't care. And by demolishing them, demolishing them, we can make a lot of money. That's the space occupied by the use for new constructions and you know um, um, real estate profit. And that, that is what happened in Vienna, for instance. You know, they demolished the entire set of city walls and, and made a new alley viewed with all the public buildings. So big money. Uh, but uh, later, you know, this idea of conservation, preservation uh, for the future generations and the uh, value of heritage, that's quite new, you know, after the Second World War, as um, defined an uh, attitude uh, came about. And so some ideas would try to protect those. Uh, you know, leftovers of what was there before. Now, today in Galata, there are some fragments of the walls, quite a few, not many, but moreover, their trace is visible in the urban tissue that grew attached to those walls, giving them, giving the walls to the urban tissue a, a form, a shape, determining its shape. So the walls are not there anymore, but the shape the walls is there through the urban tissue of a confirmation of the surroundings. So in your design, you might want to take into account this idea of the walls, the location of the walls being the foundations of the walls underground, perhaps, because they demolish what was above ground, not what is underground. Moreover, taking it, uh, you know, the, the, the walls themselves as part of your design proposal, okay? Because the city of Galata, you know, the walls are the city themselves, said Isidore de Seville. So the walls are not there anymore, the city is, but if you design a museum of the city, the walls are a big part of the picture, in my opinion. Can, uh, can I give some suggestion? Uh, if, if, uh, Alessandro, can I tell something? Yes. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, in design process, sometimes maybe you don't have any more the evidence outside, okay, of walls, something like this. But you have the traces on the ground, underground, as Alessandro just mentioned. So maybe in the design process, even just indicating, for instance, on the ground, even within your project area, where the walls were. It's not that you have to redesign, please. You don't have to rebuild the walls, okay? That is something that we is unacceptable for us. I mean, walls are gone, unfortunately, completely. But maybe showing the traces on the ground, like a path, maybe different colors or different materials to indicate both in the landscape design of the area or maybe within, within your buildings, where the walls were, where some of the parts of the turrets were. I mean, this maybe can be a way to not preserve because it's gone, but at least to put attention of what there was there before. I think these kind of interventions today, they are very much uh, used. Uh, if you uh, attended the uh, Gokanab Giolu design conference in uh, our school this semester, he exactly showed a kind of similar example in Kuru Cheshme Divan Hotel in Istanbul, where actually the parts of the archaeological area was not any more existence, but he wants to keep the traces uh, at level just of pattern on the on the pavements, showing the traces of the previous building. Just to give you a small example, but there are plenty of examples like this. So please, uh, you have always to, okay, we are building in the future, but we are trying always to preserve at least the memory of the past, where the past is not anymore existent. At least we have to consider the memories left by the past. Thank you. Do we have any other question or comment? Okay, now Osgus um, Gulan, she is going to talk, show us briefly, uh, you know, the memory of um, our classroom, which is dedicated to Sedat Haki El Dem. And in a second, she can give us a very short presentation about this very important market. But talk about walls and design. I just want to show you one example of the 
you know, design approach, specific architect, that's Giorgio Grassi, very important uh, Italian architect, where the, you know, the, somehow there, there are many other projects by Grassi where this idea of the wall, so the, the architecture as a wall structure, not as a lightweight, uh, you know, glass, uh, if, if, um, immaterial construction, but as, you know, the building as a, as a wall structure, resembling, therefore, city walls. You see the Madeline, the tower, but this is a school, right? It's not a wall. It's a school in the, in the countryside. And, and the, in my opinion, Giorgio Grassi, um, you know, is one architect to look uh, carefully to if you want to design something that looks like a wall. Okay, Uskis Gubanci is PhD candidate and research assistant at the Faculty of Architecture and Design of Bozig University, and she's going to um, uh, recall the memory of Sedat Haki Heldem, to whom our class, Ripple classroom, is dedicated. Thank you, Uskis. Thank you, Mirza. Yes. You and me started. Can you mute the? Okay, thank you. Uh, when we started online education and uh, created the online lecture halls, Professor Kamis um, asked me that we should dedicate uh, this hall to one of the pioneers of the architecture in Turkey. And in that time, our studies were mostly focused on the use of models and building typology for architectural design. And in case that the first name that I taught in that context was Sadat Akaldam. He gave architecture education for 48 years in the academy, which we uh, know today with the name Nimar Sinan Fine Arts University. And besides he designed and built very important examples of civil architecture and prepared an extensive documentation about the built heritage of Ottoman Empire. And still the majority of his archive is still in Mimar Sinan Finance University, but unfortunately some part of it is lost today due to a fire that happened in the past years. And uh, one of the most known examples of his aim to create a modern national architecture was Tashli Coffee House in Machka, where uh, we can see the use of models uh, such as uh, Amjazad Hussein Pasha mentioned, which is the known oldest residential building in Istanbul from Ottoman times, and the, we see the interpretation of the design elements coming from that uh, building in his design. He's, even he says that the plan is exactly coming from uh, this particular building. And I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with his work on identifying the typology of Turkish house, uh, which is a very often cited source in the studies of residential architecture in Turkey. And his books on building materials and construction methods named Diapur, which means construction, is very valuable source uh, for every architecture student in Turkey, I believe. I, uh, I didn't want to lecture on his work, which can take hours, and I am not an expert on this issue. But lastly, I would like to share a particular project because I think that it can be uh, related to the topic that we are working on. Um, this project, uh, uh, he took uh, part in the design of this uh, project that was selected as the winner of the competition for a courthouse in Sultan Ahmed next to Ibrahim Pasha Palace um, as an interesting example of design in historical context in a very visible location because you see the Sultan Ahmed uh, made an say the square of Sultan Ahmed in front of the building. And in the elevations, this is the elevation from Sultan Ahmed. Uh, we see a very careful interpretation of the scale and continuation um, of the urban tissue. And this part was supposed to look towards the um, Sultan Ahmed Maidana. So uh, that part that you see in the plans was uh, seen in the maquette. That part was uh, not built because during the construction of this building, the remains of Palace of Antiochus was found underneath. So 
again, you are working in the shore of Galata and the building is going to be something which is very visible. In that case, that opportunity was, again, because there were some archeological remains that was not really possible, but it is an interesting example if we see the facade design of it. And for um, anyone that would like to get for in more information about his work, I can uh, suggest reading, especially Nezi Haisa's very compact article about uh, every book that he wrote and every building that he designed. And also um, Sarah Maragiai's artic article on his approach to uh, cultural heritage and how to use the models for architectural design is a very interesting source for our students that can uh, read the article in English. Uh, thank you for listening. <clears throat> thank you very much, Ozke Ozgovanshi, for um, honoring the memory of Sadat Haki Eldem, to whom our virtual classroom is dedicated. So this is a virtual space, but it has a name, and that is the name of a very important Turkish architect. So thank you very much. We're done for today. I'm going to stop.